All righty, so uh, since you do know that we're going through Ephesians, if you would, turn with me in your Bibles to the book of Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 1. And we're going to, I'm going to read verses 1 through 4. And I know that we covered a couple of those verses last week, but it's good just to recall and then to remind ourselves where the Apostle Paul's coming from. So I'll begin in verse 1 of Ephesians 1. Scripture says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as He chose us in Him from the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before Him. Let's go to the, uh, the Lord in prayer and ask that He would help us to understand His Word. Father, now as this, we go to Your Word, and Father, as I preach it, I ask that we would be transformed by the renewing of our minds, that Your Holy Spirit would illuminate the text um, to myself and to the, the brethren in this place, Lord, that we would be conformed to Christ's image. For we know that that is what you have chosen us for, as Romans 8 tells us. And Father, if anyone hears this who is unconverted, who is unsure about their right standing before you, may they come to the full assurance of faith by trusting in Christ's work. And we pray ultimately, Father, that you were glorified through this and in this and in our lives forever. Amen. So the title of this is Trinitarian Salvation, the Father's Election. And it's actually going to be the part one because uh, I looked at these few verses and I realized that there is uh, a lot to cover. So I want to take it at bite-sized pieces. I'm actually going to go over a lot of what we looked at last week because repetition sometimes is beneficial, especially when we're trying to grasp something very abstract, very weighty, very uh, even hard many times to, uh, for us to understand. It's good to go back over. And also we're going to look at some new things. And I and put the first part there. Trinitarian salvation. Because we're going to do almost like a mini series. Because in verses 1 through about 14. That's really what it's about. In this first part of this chapter. It's about Trinitarian salvation. It simply means that salvation is accomplished by the members of the Trinity. The Father, Son, and Holy Spirit work in unity to bring about the salvation of God's people. Just a little recap of last week. We looked at what was called election and predestination in verses 3 through 5. And like I said, we're going to look a little bit more at that same truth. It's kind of like if someone goes to a, an art gallery and they, and they find a, a very complex painting. It, it's very detailed. And the painter took a lot of time to write it. And there's just so much extravagant detail, they would hate to just briefly look it over because they would miss a lot of the fine points. Instead, they go and they look over it, and then they go back and look over it again, and, and again, and again, and study its beauty. That they may be able to appreciate it for what it is. And how similar that is to especially a text of Scripture like this, because it, it talks about very weighty and very deep realities of our faith. And so it's helpful for us to, to re-look at those things, to look over those truths that we can grow and deepen our understanding, that our theology might become deeper so that our worship might become greater. See, the greater your theology, the greater the doxology. You, you become more extravagant in your worship when your understanding of God is heightened. Your worship of God is heightened when your understanding of God is heightened. These verses are wonderful. They have lots of truth in them. They're very, very deep. And I just want to do justice to the passage. I don't want to skip over it for fear that I might not be faithful to proclaim the full counsel of God. And so as I said a moment ago, predestination and election, they're two doctrines, and they're very encouraging to specifically to the Christian. To us as believers, these two doctrines are, bring so much comfort to the heart of the believer. And we'll, we'll see why. We'll see that how that unfolds before us. Because this text... Like a lot of Apostle Paul's writings, 
he does almost like this layering on, and it just layers after layers after layers, and so you see it how it unfolds before you. It brings us supreme joy because our salvation has been determined in eternity past. It has been set in stone by the blessed triune God. In fact, our predestination and election is all over the Bible. I've read the entirety of Scripture, and I'm always rereading and going back over and, and consuming more, and I see it on every page, it, se it seems. It's just spoken of and brought about a lot even in the Old Testament. Sometimes we'll think that uh, something we see very clearly in the New Testament just is absent in the Old. That's clearly not true. In fact, in Romans 9, which is what I took you all to last week, and I will probably do that a couple more times in the next couple of weeks, because Romans 9 is a very key passage on understanding predestination and understanding election. In Romans 9, the Apostle Paul quotes the Old Testament ten times in 33 verses. That is astounding. Very astounding. In fact, uh, you just don't find chapters like that in the New Testament that are packed with Old Testament references. What was he doing there? It was to show us the uniformity of God's, of God's revelation. That it, it, the, every, every author in Scripture, every book is, is like a voice in a choir, all singing in one accord to this blessed reality that God is sovereign in salvation. It's very important we understand that God is sovereign in salvation. It's a consistent thread. It's, it's like a, a, a little thread going through every book of Scripture. Psalm 135 verse 6 says, Whatever the Lord pleases, He does. In heaven and in earth, in the seas and all the deeps. In Proverbs 16, 4, listen to this. It says, the Lord has made everything for its own purpose, even the wicked for the day of evil. He's talking about the day of judgment. So God's sovereign not only over salvation, but reprobation. But damnation. He's also sovereign even over damnation. Job confessed to God in Job 42, 2, he said, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. When God determines to do something, when God is, is at work in a situation, and we know he's in work, has, he is in, at work right now in everything, in all things, he is ordained therein. And so we know that his purposes cannot be thwarted. And you can already kind of see how that rolls out into the Christian life. The implications of this. That everything in our life, not only God, it's not only that God has not, not only that God has known about it, but it's further than that. God is the one who caused it to happen. He's ordaining it. So every event, we can look at it not as, oh, I'm bitter at this person, or I'm bitter at that, what, I, my employer for doing this, or I hate that this certain thing in my life happened. We can say no. In the words of the Apostle Paul in Romans 8, we can say, and we know that God causes all things to work together for our good. Last time I checked, all things means all things. It doesn't mean anything else, friends. A low view of God produces low worship, low moral standards of living. It brings everything in the Christian life down. When you have a high view of God, everything grows greater. Your holiness is, is profoundly expanded. And there's a lot of different, I guess you could say sects or different groups within what would be broad evangelicalism who hold to a very low view of God. One of them is the Word of Faith movement, or what we would say the Prosperity Gospel movement. In fact, one of the most uh, popular Prosperity Gospel preachers, I don't know if you've ever heard of him, you may have seen him on the television before, his name Jesse Duplantis. And um, Jesse Duplantis, listen to this, this is a, this is a, a snippet from one of his, one of his teachings. He says, friends, have frank and open conversations with one another. I've done that with the Lord. I've, I've had the Lord say, Jesse, I've had a God come tell me this is what I'm going to do. I've had the Lord, and he'll say, what do you think about this? God has asked me for my opinion. I said, well, Lord, since you asked, maybe I'm doing dot, dot, dot. He said, no, we can talk for, um, frankly. What do you think? Well, I don't think you ought to do that. He said, why don't you think I ought to do that? I said, well, you know, I know you know uh, people more than I, but you, Lord, 
if you just let me, let me do a little more work on this individual. I think we can get him to you. He says, okay, go ahead. Do what you have to do. And I tell you what, the Bible says, he who is, wins souls is wise. Who can counsel? Who, who, who can be God's counselor? Who can tell God what to do? No man. But listen to this, it gets worse. This is another, uh, a separate teaching, a snippet from one of the, those. He says, I'm going to say something that's going to knock your lights off. Uh-oh. God has the power to take life, but he can't. He's got the power to do it, but he won't. He's bound. He can't. He says death and life is in the power of whose tongue? Yours. Are you ready for this? Do you want something to knock your lights off? You choose when you live. You choose when you die. Death and life is in the power of your tongue. Blasphemy. Utter blasphemy. See, I've had Christians before say to me, a lot of these prosperity preachers, and say, well, you know, maybe they started out okay, they just kind of wandered. No, these people are the enemies of God to the uttermost. They are the wolves in sheep's clothing. No, no person indwelt by the Holy Spirit can say something so blasphemous. I mean, it's astounding to say you can somehow give God counsel. And then he goes so far as to say that even when we live, or we, we can choose whether we live or not, it's all up to us. There's no sovereignty of God. It's all up to man. It's all up to him. See, my friends, your view of, of sovereignty is either going to lie upon man or it's going to be on God. Are you going to view God as sovereign or are you going to view, view man as sovereign? We cannot be man pleasers. We have to be pride crushers. We've got to crush the pride of man and exalt the grace of God in salvation. It's blasphemy. It's a blasphemous thing to say that about God. It's so not true. I mean, you just heard some of those scriptures given. Another kind of uh, camp in what would be considered broader evangelicalism is what's called open theism. Open theism basically believes that God does not even see or know what the future is. That's how low their view of God's sovereignty is. So the future is open. Whatever happens, happens. God is, is really... I mean, he can intervene, but it's, it's, he's just, he really doesn't even know how it's going to play out. That's a scary world to live in for an open theist. How do we keep from this? How do we ourselves keep ourselves from straying from biblical teaching? Stick with biblical teaching. Go to the text. Study scripture. Have a biblical theology. And that is precisely what we're going to see. We're going to see the sovereignty of God in giving us spiritual blessings in Christ and in electing us to holiness. So just to note really quickly, kind of the context of the book of Ephesians to do a little, a little bit of review from last week. This was written about 60 AD to the uh, churches in Ephesus. And we know Paul had done a pretty extensive amount of ministry work in Ephesus. We also know that uh, Paul had experienced Persecution at the hands of people who worship the false god of Artemis. In fact, uh, they had a temple of Artemis built at Ephesus, and it was the, the seventh wonder, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. But I, I started thinking about, you know, in, in, in the mind of a, a, a regular Ephesian, like let's go back in that in that day and time and think about what, how would have a, a you know an Ephesian person, man or woman, thought of God in a generic sense? You know, think of a deity. Would they view them as sovereign or not? You know, because Paul's writing again to these Ephesians, and so these are Ephesian believers, and he's showing them this is how the true God is. But in their culture, well, how did people look at the other gods? Well, uh, Artemis, uh, the Greek god Artemis, as I said, she was popular in Ephesus, and she was worshipped there. Uh, they actually believed she was born in Ephesus. Uh, they had a very odd view of gods. They believed that they were born, and they could die, and they could have wars, and they would get angry, uh, and they would fight, they'd have family members, they'd get married, etc., etc., uh, they had a whole pantheon of gods. But notice that they had a very low view of her sovereignty. I mean, she came into existence at one point. She was never eternal God. It's true because she never existed. But just in even their theology, they didn't view her as sovereign. In the sense that Scripture paints God to be. And so that's the thing I really want you to make to contemplate, especially as we go through this, in that culture, how this would have been so against the grain of how they thought God to be. 
This was against their presupposition as Ephesians. Indeed, and therefore the scriptures fulfilled in Isaiah when God says that my ways are not your ways and my thoughts are not your thoughts. See, we think God to be one way, but he presents himself to be another. So this whole chapter, chapter one, is, is about the divine blessings that God pours out on us. And as I said, the first half is about Trinitarian salvation. And then the second half is Paul's prayer for the Ephesians, which we'll get to later on. But kind of zooming in on, on these, this first half of the chapter in verses uh, 1 through 14, we, it's so well laid out because it starts with the Father, it talks about what the Father's role is in salvation, then it goes and talks about the Son, what His role in salvation is, and then it talks about the Holy Spirit. It's astounding. I, it's beautiful to see how God's Word is so well ordered. And so, as I said, we're, gonna, we're beginning here with seeing what is God the Father's role in salvation? I mean, He did not come down and die for our sins. The Father did not. See, the, the members of the Trinity are, are they're individual in the sense that they each have roles to play in salvation, separate and distinct. The Father elects, the Father chooses a people to save, the Son dies for them, and the Spirit applies that to them. It's really glorious when you think about salvation in that way. I think... We, are, we tend especially to only think of salvation in reference to Christ. We think he's, he's, he's in, you know, in terms of the whole working of salvation, it's all found in him. But when you look at, at redemptive history, it's the Father's role as well playing into that and his work and the Spirit. So we're going to see here, we're going to see two things in, the, in these two verses. We're going to look at verses 3 and 4. And uh, this breaks down very simply. Verse 3 is about our spiritual blessings in Christ, and then verse 4 is about our election unto holiness. So let's look at the first thing. Spiritual blessings in Christ. So Paul says in that verse 3, he says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Mm, blessed be the Lord indeed. You know, genuine, genuine Christians, what do we do? We extol God. We praise Him because we comprehend what? What He's given us. We understand God has saved us from our sins. And so, yeah, of course, Paul has this attitude. It's an attitude of gratitude. It's the beatitude attitude. It's the attitude of thanksgiving. In fact, if, if someone were to walk into uh, your house one day, let's just say, or, or perhaps your place of employment, and they gave you a, a check for $5 million, you would be overwhelming in gratitude toward them. In fact, you would probably be tempted to say, whatever you ask me to do, I will do for you. I'm grateful. And so too it is with God who has given us eternal life in Christ. And therefore, in the heart of the genuine child of God springs forth gratitude. So he continues. He says, So blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us, this is so awesome, with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Every spiritual blessing. What are some of those, though? Because he doesn't necessarily, in this verse, spell out what those are. Well, there's so many that time would certainly flee from me if I tried to go through every one. But just a few to highlight is, firstly, forgiveness of sin. We sin. We are condemned to hell outside of Christ by default. And Christ gives us forgiveness of sin. That's one of the blessings we have in Him. In fact, Acts 10.31 says... Of him, that's Christ, all the prophets bear witness that through his name, everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sin. That's precious. That's, that's, that is so glorious. Another thing that God bestows upon us, he dispenses to us in salvation is imputed righteousness. Imputed righteousness. Now, we all know what righteousness means. It means you're you know, perfect and holy and pure. You're right. It's where it's, the word's derived from the word right. But what does imputed mean? We don't use that word in, uh, in really any area of life anymore. But it's a legal term. It means credited. You're, you're crediting something over to someone else. You're accounting. So in the context of salvation, what the term imputed righteousness means is God counts us as having lived Christ's life. Because he on the cross counted Christ as having lived our life. It's that exchange. It's that beautiful switching over. He takes my sin and I get his perfect righteousness. 
The prophet Jeremiah, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said this was going to happen. In Jeremiah 23, verse 6, he says, And this is the name by which he, speaking of Christ, will be called Yahweh to Sitkanu, the Lord our righteousness. He himself is our salvation. The other day I was in downtown Greenville and I had preached the bad news. I had told people about God's judgment in hell. And then when I got to the part where I was going to present the good news of Christ, I remember saying something to the effect of, folks, do you want to know what the good news is? Do you want to know what the good news of the message is? Of, uh, you know, what the good news of life is? Jesus. He himself is the good news. That God has given him up, has sent him into the world. And in him, all the riches of salvation are found. Another thing that we have as believers, another spiritual blessing, is that we have a clean conscience. We have a clean conscience. We're cleansed from guilt. Hebrews 10, 22 says, Let us draw near with a sincere heart and full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience. There's no guilt. If we experience guilt in the, in the sense that, uh, I mean, there's an appropriate time when the Holy Spirit brings conviction. He brings us to a point of conviction over sin if we, if we sin against the Lord. But never should we feel uh, a weight of guilt as if our sin has not been paid for, as if our sin has not been atoned for. For that is disbelief. That's a sin to reject the testimony which has been given, that he paid it all. And we do nothing to earn it. As I said, when I first began listing these off, there's so many, uh, little time, uh, very little time to, to cover this. But this section not only refers to just, in a generic sense, all the blessings of salvation, uh, salvation but it specifically references what's coming, what Paul's going to say in the next verse, which is specifically election. God elects us to eternal life, which we will now behold. Let's look at the second thing, verse 4. This is election unto holiness. Election unto holiness. Verse 4. Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Now, the two words there at the beginning, just as, that's the Apostle Paul further explaining what was just spoken in verse 3. So he says, Christ in Him are, are our blessings of eternal life. Our spiritual blessings found in Him. And then in verse 4, he enumerates, he explains what that is. Now the first person spoken of, he says, just as He, who is that? Well, we know from the previous verse, that is the Father. That is God the Father. God is the acting agent in salvation. Do you see how in this chapter, when Paul is talking about eternal life and salvation, it's always God, God, God does this, God does that. There's no mention of men, there's no mention of their choice. It's God Himself working. In fact, Jonah 2.9 says, the prophet Jonah, in the, it's interesting, he actually was, he prayed this in the belly of the fish, or perhaps it was a whale, we're not sure. But he prayed uh, in verse 9 of Jonah 2, he says, salvation is of Yahweh. Salvation is of the Lord. 100%. Romans 9.16 says, so then it does not depend on the man who wills or the man who runs but on God of His mercy. In John 6, 44. See, my friends, this is, not, this is not only the teaching of the Apostle Paul or even the, the prophets of old, but this was specifically and chiefly put forth by our Lord Jesus in His ministry. Listen to John 6, 44. Jesus told this to the unbelieving Jews. He's not talking even to Christians. He says this to unbelieving Jews. Listen, can you think how offended they would have been when, they, when He had said this? Verse 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up on the last day. You can't. Jesus presented salvation as an impossibility. But when his disciples asked him, What Lord, or who, who then can be saved? He said, What is impossible with man is possible with God. God himself is the one who saves. And then in John 6, 44, at the end of the chapter, it says these words, beginning in verse 65, and he was saying, for this reason, now this is Jesus speaking to them again, the Jewish people, for this reason, I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it has been granted 
him from the Father. So he just quoted again what he had just said a few verses back. And uh, excuse me, I, I said something incorrect there. He's not speaking, in these verses, he's speaking to his, those who claim to be his followers now. So he's speaking to his quoted unquote disciples, those who on the outside would say, yes, we're followers of Jesus. That he's quoting, or he's talking to them. And it continues, it says, as a result of this, many of his disciples withdrew and were not walking with him anymore. Why were they offended? Because he says, you can't do it. You can't be saved. Your works, your choice, your even what people would may say free will, you can't do it. God does it. God's the one who elects. God's the one who draws. God's the one who calls. God's the one who justifies. And this crushes men's pride. That's why so many, even a lot of Christians, deny the sovereignty of God and salvation. Is it because it's repulsive to human nature? It's repulsive. It's a repulsive to unconverted flesh. Because prideful men do not want to be humbled. Certainly not. And prideful men don't want to give God the glory. But real genuine believers love the sovereignty of God. And they exalt Him. They exalt that. I can say for myself, personally as a believer, the sovereignty of God produces within me such adoration for the Lord. I mean, just to think the, the, the extent of His reign. Our God reigns. When a king reigns over a kingdom, he is the sovereign one. He's the one who makes the calls. He's the one who chooses what happens. How much more God, who reigns over the heavens and the earth and all that is in the world. Charles Spurgeon had this to say about salvation, specifically concerning God's sovereignty. He says, you will find all true theology summed up in these two short sentences. Salvation is all of the grace of God. Damnation is all of the will of man. See, my friends, a lot of people will say, well, okay, we understand the Bible says that, but what about the idea of free will? People say, well, what, you know, that's a very valid argument that they ask, and, and they're questioning and wanting to understand what is the relation between that? How can God be sovereign and how can man, quote unquote, have a free will? Well, the issue lies therein with the understanding of what is free will. See, what they are saying is we are fully 100% autonomous. That's certainly not true, though. Here's why. It's not that God is putting a barrier around us as if we can't do anything. It's because of our sin nature. See, my friends, we act according to our nature. People act according to our nature. I think I used an analogy last week about the pig and the, the, the sloth versus the, the fine food. Humans will always choose the fine food versus the sloth, but a pig will always choose sloth. Because even the pig and the human being, they act according to the way that they are. The nature that they possess determines the decisions they make. And so an unregenerate person, someone who is dead in their sins, as, as Ephesians 2, 1 says, so in the next chapter he says the same thing. Chapter 2, verse 1, he says, and you were dead in your sins. People who are outside of Christ are dead. Okay. They are, and in fact, in that same chapter, he says they are uh, under the control of Satan. They hate God, as Romans 1 says. So what is their nature to do then? What is their disposition? Is it to do righteousness? Is it to choose God? It, no, absolutely not. As so I encounter people, even Christians will say this to me sometimes. People are just searching. People are just searching for God. No, they're not. They're not searching for God. They hate God. They're repulsed by God. The only one who searches is God himself. And he searches out his people and saves them. You know, there's this whole thing called the seeker sensitive movement. Where they, they, uh, a lot of churches will change the worship service, change the way they conduct service. To quote and unquote be more appealing to an unbeliever, someone who's seeking. But they have it all backwards. Because the only one who seeks is Jesus. So if we want to, if we want to order our worship service, we want to order our church... To be seeker sensitive, we need to be sure we're honoring Him and exalting Him because He's the seeker. He's the one who seeks. What did He say in Luke 19.10? For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. People do not seek after God. That's precisely what Romans 3 says. The Apostle Paul in Romans 3 says, quotes a passage of Psalm, a section out of Psalms, where the psalmist says in Psalm, I think it's in Psalm 14, he says, there is none who seeks for God. 
That is why God is sovereign salvation. Because our will is bound to do sin only. People will never choose Christ. They will never choose God. They will never choose holiness. Because their will is bound to only do sin. And so God has to intervene. God has to do a work. And you see how God is glorified in that? Because it, it is 100% of Him. In fact, Spurgeon, I'll quote another, um, another thing Spurgeon said about this. He said, Free will carried many a soul to hell, but never a soul to heaven. How true that is. In fact, if God left us to our own quote and unquote free will, it would take us straight to the pit of hell. I mean, just, just think about your life as a believer before you were converted. Think about that. Think about the sin you lived in. You had no regard for holiness, no regard for God, did not love His Word, did not care to pray. So you're going to tell me that just one day you just changed your mind? You just all of a sudden decided you're going to come to Christ? Friends, don't, don't, don't insult God by trying to take credit for something He did. No, my friends, what happened was God said, let there be light. And there was light in your darkened soul and you were saved because God acted. Many people will be offended by this message. Even Christians will disagree with this. But I am here for one purpose, to exalt the Lord Jesus Christ and to exalt God's grace and salvation. And people will say, well, what about evangelism? Why do you evangelize? I can answer, especially as, as an evangelist, as someone who does it all the time, because I have the privilege of taking part in that. God has invited me to be used in His hand as a tool to bring His people to Himself. But notice how I'm worried. Who's doing it? Him? He's using me. And guess what? If I don't go, or if I'm not able to make, if I'm not able to make it one day or something, if a car breaks down, I'm not in a frantic mess, because I know that God's doing it. It's not me. He'll bring someone down there if He wants them to hear the message of the gospel. And if He doesn't, He he won't bring them. He is sovereign. See, my friends, the sovereignty of God is the pillow upon which we rest our heads at night. Think about that. Think about all the things that go on in our lives, the painful experiences we have. If we believe God was not sovereign, I don't know how any of us could sleep. But we know, alas, our Creator, He is working all things for our good and His glory. And so we can rest easy, even this very evening. I also want to note, it says uh, that He chose us in Him. He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. Um, it wasn't like this. A lot of people look at it like this way. They look at it a little very, uh, I would say, very confusingly. They say, okay, so God looked in the future and, and saw I was going to choose Him. And so He chose me. No, that's a warped view. Because then what you're saying is, oh, it goes back on you again. It's ultimately you. In fact, you're going to say, salvation is my work. Because ultimately what separates you from the atheist or the pagan is because you chose God and they didn't. You were good enough they didn't. You made the right choice and they didn't. No. God looked at the future and saw you and me and all of humanity as ungodly sinners who needed grace. We're all on the same level playing. We're, we're dead in sin. And said so God in His mercy chooses the church. There's no mixed view. There's no, well, it's partially man, partially God. It's God. It's 100% God. For His glory. Forever. Enough with man-centered theology. Enough with man-centered, pride-exalting preaching and teaching. In fact, I, I don't even want to call it that. It's not preaching and teaching if it's man-exalting. Bring God the glory. I mean, brethren, my heart burns within me to see God glorified. I just want Him to be exalted as the Sovereign Lord of Salvation. Now going back to the text, it says He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world. That's Christ. He's the only way. We know that. John 14, 6, He's the way. Acts 4, 12, There's no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. Christ is the only way of salvation. But I want to stop here and say this too. He says, Just as He chose us in Him before the foundation of the world, I want to tell you about a particular doctrine, and it's very, it's very wonderful to think about. It's called the covenant of redemption. 
the covenant of redemption, we're all familiar, at least in a very generic sense, of what a covenant is. It's an agreement between two parties concerning some outcome, whatever it may be. Uh, some of them may be, you know, you have to do this and I'll do this. It, it's very generic. What was the first, we ask ourselves, what was the first covenant in the Bible? In terms of the history of the world, the history of mankind, what was the first covenant that ever been enacted? Well, when we look, we see in Genesis, God and Adam make a covenant. God says, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree or else you'll die. That's a covenant. Because he's saying, I'll keep my end, you keep yours. And if you don't keep your end, guess what's going to happen? I'm going to render judgment on you and you're going to be cut, cut off from the garden. And you're going to die. Spiritually, of course. But actually, Scripture talks about a covenant that was made before the world was even founded. This is, this is a beautiful mystery, brethren. There was a covenant that was made before anything was created. And that is the covenant of redemption. It was made before time itself, itself existed. When all three of the members of the Trinity were in this perfect triangle of love, this perfect glory before anything had its origin. And it has three members, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. What is it? What are the conditions? What are the, here are the conditions. God the Father says to the Son, I have chosen a people to myself whom I will save. What you must do is you must come to the world, be born of a virgin. You must fill the law, fulfill it perfectly. You must die upon the cross and be slain under my wrath so that I can save these people. So that this bride that I have selected for you, my Son, can be eternally redeemed, can be brought into glory. And so the Son replies, I shall do that. I shall. See, Scripture says, Christ is the Lamb of God who was slain from the foundation of the world. What's that mean? This is something God planned before anything even was created. This has been in the mind of God since eternity past. That's just so, it's wonderful to think about. And so, here's the amazing thing. And then this is where the Spirit comes in. Then the Holy Spirit is a part of this as well. Because he is charged with the task of enabling Jesus in his earthly ministry to do these things. To live a perfect life. You know, we see all throughout the Gospels what to say. The Spirit, Jesus was in the Spirit. He did this by the Spirit. He was always empowered by the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity. And then, the third person of the Trinity also has another, another role to play in this covenant. He is to come upon the elect, us, and save us. Come into our hearts, give us faith, give us grace to repent, and to believe the Gospel. He causes us to believe. He gives us that grace to believe. And so all three of the members of the Trinity are working in this covenant. And it's called the covenant of redemption. And God promises a reward to Jesus. In an eternity past, He promises a reward. That if He suffers under God's wrath for the people of God, He will receive a kingdom. He will receive a bride, and that is the church whom he has died for. He will reign on the throne of his father, David, and he will be exalted forevermore. And guess what? I can assure you, the covenant has been kept by Christ. He kept it. He fulfilled it. The Spirit enabled him to do so. And now today, that's still playing out in the lives of all the people of God. The Spirit has, is still, even this day, coming upon people, saving them. The Holy Spirit is, is causing them to be born again and that, to believe the gospel message. And they are, they are born from above. All of God. 100%. Trinitarian salvation. It's glorious. You may say, well, what's some scriptures for this? I'm glad to give you just a couple of them. There's so many. On it. We, we could do a sermon series on it. In fact, that would be something we could certainly do one day. But uh, John, uh, in, in John 17, when Jesus is praying to the Father in verse 5, listen to what he says. Listen to the wording he, he selects. He employs particular wording. He says in verse 5, Now, Father, glorify me together with yourself with the glory which I had bef before with you. Before the world was. So wait a second. He's referencing this time before anything had been created. He was with the Father. And then he says this. In verse 6. He says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours and you gave them to me. God selects. Gives them to the Son. Jesus dies for them. And makes his bride beautiful for himself. 
Matthew 3, in verse 16. It says, After being baptized, Jesus came up immediately from the water, and behold, the heavens were open, and he saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lightning on him, and behold, a voice of the heavens said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. How many members of the Trinity are there? Father, Son, and Spirit, all three of them. Christ is, is fulfilling the covenant as, that's, as this verse is being written, or as it's being spoken of here in this narrative. He's fulfilling this covenant. And so the Father's looking down and saying, I'm being pleased by what you're doing. I'm being pleased by your fulfilling this covenant. And the Spirit is there coming upon him to enable him to finish the task. By God, for God, for his glory. The, uh, Dr. R.C. Sproul says this, Because this covenant was never violated, we reap its benefits as heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. Glory to God for that. I love that. I love the way he words that. It was fulfilled by someone else, and we just simply get the benefits of it. And as I said a moment ago, before the foundation of the world, this all happened in eternity past, and now it's playing out. Zero percent of man, 100 percent of God. God's choice crushes the pride of man. It abases his pridefulness and his self-confidence, and it puts him down in his lowly place where he ought to be. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says in Romans 11. In verse 1, he says, I say that has God not rejected, rejected his people, has he? May it never be. For I too am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Or do you not know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? How he pleads with God against Israel. So just to note quickly, the context of that was Elijah was living in Israel. Most of them had abandoned the Lord God. They were worshiping the Baals. And he cries out to God. He's so desperate. He doesn't even think there's another born again Israelite in Israel at that point. He doesn't think there's even an, uh, an actual genuine follower of the Most High in Israel at that point. He thought they'd all abandoned the Lord. And so in verse 3, said, he says, Lord, they have killed your prophets and have torn down your altars. And I alone am left, and they are seeking my life. But what is the divine response to them? Notice the wording. What does God say? I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. Verse 5, in the same way then, there has also come to be at the present time a remnant according to God's gracious choice. Who's it up to? God. God's gracious choice. And then verse 6. Notice what he says, and this is so profound. If it is by grace, it is no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace is no longer grace. If you believe that it's ultimately up to man, or even halfway, halfway man, halfway God, you're believing half works. You're trusting in, you're saying, man ultimately is the one who's going to decide. Even if God, okay, we'll set, or even, even if you said, God does 99% and man just does 10 it's still rejection of the gospel. It's 100% grace. And what is the end to which God has chosen us? Why has God chosen us? What is the end purpose of it? Well, Paul says it in verse 4. That we would be holy and blameless before Him. That's the purpose of it. We're the elect. We're the church. We're the bride whom the Father has selected and given to His Son. And even that. That's exactly what they did in ancient days. They would, the father would choose. Or the families would arrange a marriage. It wasn't just like the son would go and pick them out. It's glorious how even that plays into that. So God sets us apart to be holy. In eternity past, God set us apart to be set apart. See, that's what holy means. Holy means separates, consecrated. So God, in eternity past, sets us apart so that we can be set apart. Of course, I'm using the term in two different senses, but nonetheless, the play on words there, perhaps that would help you to remember. And then he says blameless as well. That means we're without guilt. Why? Who fulfilled the covenant? Christ. Christ fulfilled the covenant. Christ fulfilled it on behalf of his bride, whom God had given to him. In fact, if you turn with me to Ephesians 5, because you're probably there in Ephesians 1, listen to the words of Ephesians 5 in verse 25. Listen to what the Apostle Paul says here. He says, husbands, love your wives just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her so that he might sanctify. That's another term for holy. Make her holy. He might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, 
And now listen to verse 27. That he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. What is the two words he uses in Ephesians 1? Holy and blameless. He brings it in chapter 5 and says the same thing. We're the bride of Christ. We're the betrothed and we're waiting for the marriage supper of the Lamb. That's glorious. You want to know the greatest love story? You want to know the greatest love story? The love story between Christ and the church. Every other love story that we see, maybe in movies, or portrayed in a book or a novel, or even we read about in the news, perhaps among, you know, about a couple who's been married for 65 years or some a very extensive period. In fact, like yesterday I was just at my great aunt's house and I was learning a little bit more about my, my great grandfather and he and my great grandmother had been married for was over 60 years a very long time but you know what's a much greater love story is the love story that is eternal and that's between Christ and the church see every other love story is going to be it's going to end one day and it's going to be forgotten there will be no marriage in heaven but it's about Christ and his love for his church it's beautiful. It's so, so beautiful. And notice again, in Ephesians 5, he uses no terminology concerning man. He just says, Christ is the one who makes her holy. He's the one who makes her blameless. He's the one who's washing her by the water of the word. It's him, it's him, it's him. It's by him. And for him. And notice, ending at verse 4, he says, holy and blameless before Him. Ultimately, we're going to stand before God, saying, brethren. But for those of us who have been chosen unto life, God either has or will make us holy to stand before Him. To bring us to eternal bliss. The implications of this reality, the implications of election, of the Father's choice and salvation is very much, perhaps even, life-changing for the Christian. I would say so. Firstly, it provides us rest. We can rest knowing we contributed nothing to salvation. And therefore, because we contributed nothing to make it start, we will not contribute anything to make it continue, or for it to be brought to its eschatological end, to its end ultimately, to be brought in glory. That's all God's working, and He will bring it to pass. As Philippians 1.6 says, Paul says, For I am confident that He began His good work in you, will perfect it until the day of Christ Jesus. Who, who began the good work? God. Who's going to continue it? God. And who will complete it? God. And this also reminds us that we are to preach a salvation that is by grace alone. As Ephesians 2 says, which we will, we will eventually get to, the Apostle says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. We are to grow in biblical theology. When we, really, when we really begin to think about the implications of this, our hearts erupt in, 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 awe, in awe-inspired worship of the Most High because of His sovereignty. And perhaps any unbelievers. The question may arise, well, how do I know I'm elect? I mean, how do I know that God has chosen me? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. That's how you know. If you believe on Him, then you have been. Because belief is a gift. Belief is something God does in us. As the great reformer Martin Luther said, faith is the work of God in us. And if you're outside of Christ, you're dead in sin. Your will is bound only to sin. And you will bring your own self to hell. Your will will only damn you, as the, as the, as the great preacher Charles Spurgeon said. Cry out to God for mercy. As Acts 2.20 says, Forever will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Further implications for ministers and ministries and preachers and Christians to stop emotionally manipulating people, to stop trying to coerce people to come to Christ because they can't. See, all of that, well, with every head bowed and every eyes closed, just walk the aisle and you know, play a few more verses of just as I am. That's all built upon the fact that they believe that man ultimately is the deciding factor in it. 
But see, notice, I don't have to try and, well, we couldn't even if we wanted to get pianists up here. I don't have to try and play music or dim the lights to get anybody to do anything. Because God's the one who does it. When I'm on the streets, I don't have to force people to, to pray a prayer and then just declare them a Christian because they prayed the prayer. In fact, I, I would be deceitful, unfaithful, and unholy for doing so. Sadly, the preachers have done those very things. Emotional manipulation. We are not to do that. Only God can save. Only God can save. So we are to conduct our ministries. We are to conduct our evangelism in light of that. Knowing God will use us as tools in His hands. So we do not have to force it. We do not have to force it. For the cross of Jesus Christ will save all, for the, all of those for whom it was intended. So in conclusion, we have seen that we receive every spiritual blessing in Christ. And specifically, as we saw unfolded before us and unpacked in verse 4, it is election unto holiness. How glorious is that reality, brethren? Salvation, God's choice, God's grace, not anything of man. The covenant of redemption made in eternity past between all the members of the Trinity in that glorious triangle of love, all of grace. All of grace. The gospel of grace. The gospel which says and comes to us, comes to the rebel heart and says, God is holy. He is a righteous God and He has put forth His law. God said you shall not disobey your parents. He says you shall not fornicate. He says you shall not blaspheme. But we do these things. We have done these things. And therefore we are condemned. We are, as I said earlier, totally affected by sin to the core. And our, even our wills are totally tainted. So that even our wills will bring us to hell. We're without hope. But God, as Galatians 4, 4 says, when the fullness of time came, He sends His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the Gospel. And Jesus, in obedience to what the Father had chosen from the foundation of the world, He's obeying this covenant of redemption. He's coming into time, to space-time, and He becomes man. He fulfills the law. He dies upon the cross. He satisfies the wrath of God against the people of God. And he, He's raised to life on the third day. God the Father raises him up. It's a reward for his sufferings. He raises him up and then the Father sits him at his right hand and he's exalted there in heaven being praised by the angels. He's reigning on his throne. He's reigning over his kingdom upon the throne of his father David. And right now, the Spirit of God is at work in people's hearts to draw them to Christ so that the Lamb receives the full reward of his sufferings. Glory to the Lamb who was slain. He is worthy to receive all glory and honor. If you're unconverted, if you know you're lost, turn to Christ. Believe the gospel. Flee your sin. Trust in His atonement and God will forgive you of your sin because Christ purchased your salvation. And you will be wrapped in the glorious righteousness of Christ as we spoke on toward the beginning or as we saw earlier that we are wrapped in Christ's righteousness. God clothes us in His perfect garments of righteousness. So believe, repent and believe it. And brethren, let this truth comfort your hearts. Let this be upon your mind day in and day out. Preach the gospel to yourself and to your neighbor that you might be transformed and that they might be saved and that God ultimately might be glorified. For God is the one who works for His glory, for His honor, and for his, his praise. I'm going to leave off with these words from the Apostle Paul. After explaining the sovereignty of God and salvation, he comes to Romans 11, and he says this in verse 33, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments, and unfathomable His ways! For who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who became his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it, may be, that it might be paid back to him again? For from him and through him and to him are all things. And to him be the glory forever. Amen. Let's pray.
Oh God, what can we say in light of these precious realities, oh Lord God, that you have so graciously chosen to pour out your grace on sinners. That, Father, we do not deserve this. I am astounded that, that even I myself am saved. That I myself have been given grace. That you have looked upon me as vile and wretched as I am and have wrapped me in the righteousness of your Son. Father, I pray on behalf of anyone who does not have that righteousness this evening. Lord, please save them. And over oh, my dear brethren, Father, grow them in an understanding of your word. Work in the hearts of your sheep. Lord Jesus, shepherd your flock sovereignly by your hand. Make ready your bride for the day in which you shall return. O oh God, to you be the glory for your sovereignty, for your grace, your holiness, your gospel, the glorious gospel of grace. We praise you, Father, through Christ. And we ask that you be brought all glory forever. And we know that you will, for you are the sovereign God who is working to bring himself all glory. How precious that is. How great is our God. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, from everlasting to everlasting. Amen. Amen.